Hey folks, Scott Weingart here, and this is an MCrit Wii. This is a Wii on a product that I helped develop and I am really proud of. So I can't offer CME for this because the conflict of interest is if you buy this product, I get a tiny percentage uh, as one of the developers. Um, but I'm not just gonna be talking about the bag we created that I think is amazing, but all of the stuff in it that doesn't come with the bag that really speaks to the choices of equipment I like for airway management. Now, let me give you a bit of background about how this took place. So uh, there's a gent out there named Paul Swinton, who's this brilliant medic who did not like the way the ergonomics and logistics of pre-hospital airway went. And he developed something called the scram bag, which was this beautiful, what we call in the, uh, the industry term is a dump kit. As in you could like open it up and everything you need has been placed in front of you in, in a, a form of a dump type situation. It's, it's just boop, and everything you need is there laid out for you. And the idea of this came from the various helicopter EMS services. And then, you know, the real cool dump kits had outlines of all the objects where they're supposed to go to make it easy to stock, to make you understand immediately what you're missing if you just look at it and kind of obviate the need for checklists. Um, now, when I saw that, I'm like, this is great, but this is not built for the way that I do airway management in the emergency department or the ICU. There's a few things that are different. One, I have video laryngoscopy, and I will stress that it should be used for every single intubation. And my video laryngoscope is on a cart that has all the blade choices for it there. So I don't need to have that anywhere else. So the other thing that's different is uh, since we're gonna be going mandatorily to VL, we don't need a lot of direct blade choices. And this kit is just set up for adults. This is an adult bag. They make pediatric bags, but this is an adult bag. So with those differences and really just the way I wanted airway to be managed based on all of the years of doing MCRIT, uh, Paul was kind enough to work with me to develop a scram resus. So a bag for the resuscitationist in the hospital. And if you're in the field, then you should check out the various versions of the scram in the field. But what this really did is just accomplished everything I needed in front of me for airway management. Now let me open this bad boy up and we'll start discussing. Well, I guess before I open it up, let me just talk about some of the outside stuff. Uh, there's a spot for an RFID tag, if that's how you do your inventory. Um, a uh, beautifully strong, this was one of the things I stressed to Paul, is I'm gonna be hanging this on the wall, people are gonna be beating it up. Residents are, you know, just pure apes when it comes to how they uh, handle equipment. So I need something incredibly beefy so that uh, even if people are like, you know, putting their body weight on this thing, it shouldn't collapse. And, you know, I, I like the colorway here. This is uh, very much in the MCRIT aesthetic. Now, when you open this up, it kind of forces you to put it on a table, not on the patient's chest, which already you've, you've solved like most of the problems with the ergonomics of airway management is things are not falling on the floor. But uh, it forces you to put it on a table adjacent to the patient. And now you have your standard airway side and you really have your backup equipment side. So we'll go through them one by one. And in the midst of doing that, I'll teach you about the stuff that I like to use in airway management. So the first thing you see here is underneath each of the things you're supposed to stock is a black outline that tells you where the things are supposed to be placed. So, you know, your airways, your syringe, et cetera. And then you have these gray areas over here, BVM with end tidal CO2 and a peep valve and a filter, a uh, uh, nasal cannula type diagram, uh, a space for meds. The gray that these things are colored in are things that you have to add in from outside the bag. And it reminds you to stock them, right? So you'd have your BVM sitting there on the kit. You could put your meds there on the kit. You could put your nasal cannula there on the kit because those come from the outside. Um, now let's look at all the items that are actually stocked regularly. Now we have a backup laryngoscope still in its, uh, the blade's still in its packaging so it stays nice and clean. Um, this is not to be used except if something goes horribly awry with the actual um, intubation using video, right? So you always have a backup. So then it's gonna be a Mac 4. And now this is a disposable, it could be reusable, um, but it's really nice these disposables because they just sit there waiting to go. They're not draining the batteries um, and until you open the blade. And now you have a backup Mac 4. All right, one ET tube here. 
And it's because every patient in my world gets an 8 unless they're super tiny. Um, but 8 is my default. It allows me to do bronchoscopy. It takes care of the fact that the biofilm is going to start accumulating in there and making that lumen narrow. So everyone gets an 8 And now look, I'm, I'm showing you the way that the, uh, the Joint Commission people would like to see this. But you could absolutely, and oftentimes I do with this bag, open up the ET tube from the top. Grab out your tubing and just let it sit like that. If you intubate frequently, um, that's a great way to go because now when you're ready to get uh, set for the intubation, you're just going to grab your syringe, pop it on, check, and you're good to go. All right, so that's up to you how, how you want to store that. Um, I have a stylet. Now, we are bougie, always bougie first. The stylet is going to be back up or if we're using hyperangulated. So what makes sense to me then is to use a hyperangulated stylet because it'll work for standard uh, laryngoscopy. It works just fine with a Mac 3 to have a hyperangulated stylet on there. It'll work for hyperangulated, and it's my backup, only if I'm going to go with hyperangulated laryngoscopy. So that's, that's sitting there, ready to go. I have a standard stylet here. There's actually a space that says stylet right down there, and that, uh, I have one of those malleable stylets, just in case you need a weird shape, like you need something really anterior. That's just backup, I don't use that very much. Um, what I'm using all the time, though, for my intubations is a bougie, and so there's a nice little area here that, I don't know if you could see this, but it says bougie right there, and the bougie that I actually like is from a company called... Wow, the, the name I order from is not actually on here. I'll put it on the screen because um, I guess the, the name from the foreign vendors are a little bit different than the American vendors, and you can't order this one from, uh, from that name on the package. But what this is, this is slick as all get out. Let's get a good shot of this. So what this does is it already is in the shape of a hyperangulated blade. So already out of the package, you'll be able to intubate with hyperangulated using this bougie. But then, let's see, what's the best way to show this? Um, if you move the actual thumb thing right here, right here there's like these corrugations that allow you to put your thumb there, you can actually bend antrovert and retrovert the tip, and that allows you to, especially with a hyperangulated, but even with a standard, if you just can't quite get there with a standard shape, you could just flex, and it just goes right in. And it's super soft, super atraumatic. Uh, really love this device. So that's the bougie I actually stock in my kit. And they're a little more expensive. You know, the regular bougies are about 10 bucks a pop. I think these are like 18 or somewhere around there. So you're spending a little bit more but sometimes that money is worth it. All right, uh, we have our oral airway there. Hopefully that'll remember, remind you to use it during uh, BVM ventilation. It's really helpful for that. Peep valve is there. And then uh, my favorite ET tube securing device, which is the Hollister ETAD. Fits perfectly there, but all the other devices will fit nicely in that spot too. I take it out of its package. It's not a sterile item. There's no reason to leave it in its package. And so it's good to go for me. Uh, after intubation. All right. I have a Ducanto suction catheter in its package here. Now, these are also a little bit more expensive. Instead of like $1, I think they're like $1.80 or 2 bucks. but just a billion times better. But you don't want to tell your hospital you're going to replace every Yankauer in the ED with these. So this kit is the perfect place to keep your Ducanto suction catheter. from, And this is from es es uh, Escor. Um, and I take money from none of the companies except for the bag. The bag I take money from, all the rest I just love. Um, so the Escor Ducanto suction is a wide bore suction. The Yankowers were never meant to be do using them for what we use them for. They were meant to have that tip, that tiny hole tip, so that you could actually uh, stop bleeding when you're doing tonsillar operations, right? You could actually push it up against the, the bleeding area and hold direct pressure there while it sucks. That's why it's built that way. It was never built to evacuate large amounts of vomit from the airway. This device is. And what's cooler about this is um, you could actually place this through the cords and put a bougie through this directly in. So if you have a hemoptysis case and they're pounding out blood, you could just actually be suctioning as you go, find the cords, pop this through, 
put a bougie in, take this off, and then intubate over that bougie. Game changing. But you don't want to tell your hospital, we're replacing the entire ED stock with this. So this kit allows you to just keep them just for the intubation. All right, in their package, good to go. All right, now that's the, the downstairs here. Let, let's talk about the upstairs. A few things here. You have your uh, superglottic airway. Now this one is the one I prefer, which is a iGel 4. No cuff to have to inflate, all right? It rewards ham-handed placement. The way you screw this device up is you don't push hard enough. So, you know, the, some of them fail if you push too hard. This one fails if you push too soft. Well, when you're, you know, have a patient with a SAT of 50% that you're rescuing, um, one that fails uh, by not pushing hard enough is the one you want because uh, you, you will be ape hands when you're actually in this state. And you know if it's not sealing, then oftentimes the problem is you just have to lift the jaw and push a little bit harder. And the range on this is insane. I don't know if this is gonna be backwards or not, but this is 50 to 90 kilos. And that's, you know, that's ideal body weight, right? And that's not, you know, even if they've gained some weight since they were 70 kilos, it's still that size, which means only very tiny people in height and very tall people in height will need a different size. So this covers 50 to 90, that's the entire gamut of almost every patient you see in the emergency department. So it's right there for you, it's set, good to go. You don't have to worry about finding it. Now we have a space here for a second uh, laryngoscope handle and blade if you wanted to have a, a Mac 3 backup as well. Um, I don't see the purpose of it. I'm happy interview, intubating anyone with a Mac 4 that's an adult, um, but you have the space for it there. Filter became super important during COVID is a viral filter here, ready to go. I'm gonna show you this stuff in just a sec. Let's, let's pause on that. Let's look at this area over here, this uh, kind of uh, auxiliary supply area. I have my checklist in uh, the plastic here so I could you know, go through it. But the beauty of this is if everything's there in front of you, it takes care of so much of the checklist, right? Peep valve, oh, now I don't need that on the checklist. End tidal CO2, I don't need that on the checklist as long as I'm following the directions of the area. Backup uh, airway equipment, well, it's, all, it's all here for you, right? Um, you know, the nasal cannula to allow apneic oxygenation is there for you. Everything's there for you. So it really obviates a lot of the checklist if it is a crash intubation. Now, what's up here? Uh, we have our um, monitoring nasal cannula for end tidal CO2. We have our real nasal cannula, and these, these are no good, these monitoring ones for actually giving enough oxygen for apneic oxygenation. You really need uh, a dedicated nasal cannula for that, and that's what you have right here. We have our entitled CO2 supplies. Um, in case they weren't already placed on the BVM like they should be, we stock our BVMs with the entitled supplies there. And then if your uh, entitled fails, you have a color metric device uh, here as a backup. All right, so that, that's that little auxiliary equipment compartment. And you can put some other stuff in there if you want it. Let's talk about the failed airway stuff here. Now, up here we have the trach pouch, and it's perfectly sized for what you want to buy, which is a uh, Portex 6.0 cuffed trach. Portex is the one to go. Again, don't take money from these companies. The reason it's Portex is because their outer diameter is much smaller than Shiley's, and it fits perfectly. The other thing that'll fit in here, if you want, is a 6.5 ET tube. Just roll it up and put it in that trach pouch. That'll serve you well, too. Sometimes I'll actually put a 7 ET tube in this auxiliary compartment, uh, and that allows me to have a smaller size to fail to. Um, didn't have it in there today. What else is here? You notice everything that's failed airway, uh, for going to surgical airway, it has this yellow tab here. So there's a yellow tab here, there's another one here. What is that? It's another bougie. And why do I have another bougie? Well, I don't wanna use that flex tip bougie for uh, performing surgical airway. I want, I want good old blue, right? I want a nice stiff bougie for that. I don't want the floppy bougie with a floppy tip. I want a real bougie for performing that surgical airway. And the other thing is that you know, by the time you get to surgical airway, a lot of times the first bougie has fallen on the floor. You know, people are rushing to bag the patient and you lose that. You want a second bougie hanging out, ready to go. Um, so you have your superglottic airway failure, you have your surgical airway failure. Now let's say you knew that this is gonna progress to a difficult airway at the beginning, or you predicted it could be a difficult airway. Well, then you wanna use another option this kid has, which is, you know, you have all your equipment for the first attempt at the uh, RSI with laryngoscopy, but now what you could do is just pull on this tab and at the same time you have all of your stuff for the initial foray 
When you fail, you have a dump kit for your failure mode too. So you can take your eye gel out, put it there. You can put a marker there if you wanna mark out the cricothyroid. You can put your scalpel down, and I should've showed you where that scalpel was. Right here, you have a, a 11 blade, and on the other side, you can put a 10 blade. And I would stock them both, depending on the preference of the operator, which one they want. So you have a 10 blade and an 11 blade there, so you could lay out your scalpel of choice. You lay out your blue bougie, you put your trach there, you can put your lube there, honestly. Do you need lube for the trach? No, it's for the superglottic airway. Um, so you have that there. And you can have your uh, chlorhexidine prep if you think that's a uh, necessary thing in a crash airway. And we actually have a spot here um, right up on top for you to put a couple chlorhexidine uh, or, or alcohol preps up there. So you'd be ready to go. And now you can have your, your double setup all laid out on the dump kit. You have your primary stuff. You have your secondary stuff. Or if they're progressing to a failed airway um, and you're taking your third laryngoscopy attempt, you could tell your buddy, hey, prep out my difficult airway supplies here and they could actually lay them out for you ready to go, all right? So what else could I tell you about this bag? Waterproof, super durable uh, material. Uh, will take a beating, will wear well. Um, you might notice these two little tabs here. Well, what are those for? Well, that's actually for a, a different piece of equipment that, again, I designed with Paul Swinton. Now, they had made a med bag for EMS, and then they had made a slightly smaller med bag for the hospital. Um, but I wanted something tinier still, because I just wanted one intubation's worth of meds for a crash intubation, where I don't have time to get the exact med I wanted. You know, sometimes I'll want ketamine. Well, I'm not gonna get that in a crash, because they have to go to the Pixis and get it. I wanted something that would just be ready to go for the unexpected intubation, and, and that's the, the Scram Crash RX. Now, it fits perfectly onto these, um, those two little dots with magnets, and it just will immediately bond to the bag, and then just pulls right off. It just, it's this insanely cool thing where there's magnets inside, so they lock on, and you can't pull it off once they lock on, but then you just gently pull up, and it instantly is ready to go. Now let's talk about this a little bit. What I wanted, and what they developed for me, is something that could go in a fridge or hang on a wall, either way, and um, will go on the Crash RX bag if you want to leave it hanging on the wall. And uh, again, it has barcode, it has RFID spots, um, a little label for when, you know, like if you have multiple ones of these, but let's look inside, because I think this is just so cool. Now, what this is designed to do is um, be multimodal in its use. You have a lane here for your emergency induction agent, and these are color-coded towards the anesthesia safety standards, so yellow for induction agent, red for your paralytic, and uh, we, we made purple for the vasopressor, and then you have a flush there that's under white. And you have spots for needles, preps, the labels for the various drugs, right? And, um, and mixing instructions could go right here in this little uh, piece of plastic. Now, this one is set up for uh, where you want to leave the drugs in their vials, which is going to give you a long shelf life if you leave them in the fridge. So you have a syringe for each. You could pre-label these syringes um, with their labels, and then you just grab a needle and you open these up and you're ready to go. But the other way that this could be configured that I actually like is to actually draw up the med into the syringe, put one of those caps on, you know, like just like this, you know, and actually have the med labeled in its syringe ready to go. Now this means you really are gonna have to throw it out every 24 hours um, because that's how long they'll last uh, by shelf life. But if you're intubating frequently or at least once a day, it's totally worthwhile to have one kit set up ready to go. Now, Joint Commission's not going to like this. So you have to work with your own hospital as to whether you're gonna do that or not. Um, but uh, they instituted these new rules around it. It's become very complicated and annoying, but you know, use your judgment. Um, you have space here for either one vial of sucks or the two vials that in most places it takes to get enough rock, because these are each 50 each. All right, and then I would put in this vasopressor spot that's open right here is a, you open up a cardiac epinephrine and you actually put that just, you know, not the, the needle portion of it, just the actual vial, that glass vial there fits perfectly here on top of the syringe. And then you'd be ready to make push dose epi. You can put your push dose epi instructions right there, or, you know, it's on the label. How to mix, mix one ml in, of one to 10,000 epi and nine mls of saline. 
Um, and, you know, you'd be good to go. Now, why is this so configurable? Well, it's because on this side, on the back end of what, that medication area, are adjustable rubber for each and every strap. So you could dial them to exactly the vial size, syringe size, uh, et cetera, of your individual place. And so that's why it could be used for multiple different purposes. You know, uh, this one's no longer a vial. I'd be tightening this up a little bit, uh, ready to go. If I use a sucks vial here instead of a rocker, I have one big rock vial. These would need to be loosened up in order to fit that one big vial rather than these two little ones. So you could fully adapt it, get it ready to go. Once it's all customized, you zip this up, you never see it again until something changes in your medication stock. Um, you have another loop here that you could actually hang off things if you want to, that I keep tucked in. And there you go, so there you go. There's the Scram Recess Bag and the Scram Crash RX Med Bag. And I went through all the equipment, I went through their use cases. Um, how do I use it in the EDs I'm at? Well, you know, we don't wanna restock this one all the time. So if we have time before the intubation, we'll leave this as backup and we'll just take all the equipment out. We'll save this for a crash intubation or an intubation out of the ED. But I know many places, they'll actually put one of these uh, bags in each and every single one of their recess areas. So they'll have two or three of these set up ready to go uh, with a little lock you know, on the zippers. You know, in the zippers we have the holes here. So you could put one of those uh, cart locks, you know, those things that are breakaway locks. You could put them through the zippers, keep it locked. You know it's stocked. And then they'll use it for the intubation and then they'll restock after. And that's the, really the key to the idea behind this, uh, this bag is that instead of having to stock in order to do, you know, to set up in order to do the intubation, now everything's set up to do the intubation, you're doing your setup after the intubation. That's really the key is at the time where you're relaxed, you could get all the equipment back and put it back in the bag in the space it's supposed to be. But when you're actually intubating, you don't have to open up ET tubes, find the right size, find a syringe, find a suction. Uh, it's all there for you. Open it up, it's dumped in front of you, you're ready to go. And that's why I really wanted to develop this bag and actually make it a reality for the hospital the way I do it. So now again, if you're gonna use this, it's built upon the idea that you have a cart with a video laryngoscope, preferably with all the blade sizes you need. Um, they're good to go. That you have waveform and tidal monitoring um, available in your ED, it's not good otherwise. Um, and uh, that, you know, you really are going to be on the MCRIP mindset of uh, really wanting to maximize first pass success by having everything properly set up in front of you and good to go. All right. I'm super eager to hear any questions or ideas that you have about all this. My name is Scott Weingart. This has been an MCRIT We saying bye-bye.